Joining us now is Edwin Lyman. He's senior scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists. He's an expert on nuclear power. Uh, Dr. Lyman, thanks very much for your time today. It's great to be here. Um, between the two of us, there's only one PhD in physics, and it is yours. Uh, if you could just, if you could start by letting us know if anything that I just explained, um, if I misstated anything, or if there's anything critical that I left out. Actually, it was technically flawless, and I think you should get an honorary doctorate in nuclear engineering. <laughs> well, that's, uh, this is starting off very, very well. I like the sound of this. Uh, is, is there anything about how the situation has progressed over the last, even over the last few hours, that makes you feel any better or more reassured about the chances of preventing a big disaster here? Unfortunately, I'm getting less reassured with every update. Uh, the news that the uh, incident was affecting not just three reactors at Daiichi, but also a number of reactors at Daini, uh, indicated that the authorities were not being up front uh, a long time ago in their dealings with the public, and uh, just makes the situation seem as if it's escalating out of control. So I'm really worried about what else we're not being told at this point. When the authorities have put out statements today about pressure in some of these reactors rising, we saw one report today, for example, that pressure in one of the Daiichi reactors uh, was more than twice its designed capacity. Um, what, is, what does that mean? What are they talking about with pressure? How dangerous is that? How do, you, how do you alleviate that pressure? Well, the danger is that, of course, as the reactor gets uh, hotter and the containment atmosphere gets hotter, the pressure will increase. And um, in order to avoid a potentially catastrophic rupture uh, is that you release some of the pressure by venting some radioactive gas now and avoid a larger catastrophe later. So it's really a devil's bargain, uh, but of course the, uh, the radiation um, exposure resulting from moderate venting is going to be a lot less than if this accident actually progresses to a worst case where we have a, a full-scale core melt and then a catastrophic rupture of the containment. Uh, to be clear about that venting, that essentially is a controlled, deliberate release of some amount of radiation. And obviously that's, that's a better scenario than an unc uncontrolled release of a lot of radiation. But is there reason to be concerned even about what has been vented, even though it's been done on purpose? Well, uh, any amount of radiation is a hazard. It's um, a, an established fact that there's no safe level of radiation. So, of course, any artificial radiation introduced into the environment is a concern. But I think, um, you know, I understand the logic behind uh, doing controlled venting at this point, and I think we all just need to hope that it's going to work um, because um, if, uh, if there's a catastrophic rupture of the containment, and a large-scale core melt, we could be facing something like Chernobyl as opposed to something like Three Mile Island. At Three Mile Island, as bad as it was, uh, they were able to avert a, a full-scale containment failure, and uh, there was a, a release of radiation, but it was comparatively small. But of course, you know, you know you're dealing with comparatives here. It's it's the it's the um, you know you have two unpalatable choices, and you have to decide. I don't mean to ask you to explain the obvious, but just looking at these images from Japan today, uh, confronting the certainty of hundreds of deaths, uh, the likelihood of, of more than a thousand, if not thousands of deaths, confronting uh, the certainty of billions and billions of dollars worth of damage. Um, if there is a... Uh, if, if there is a nuclear meltdown, and as you say, we could be looking at something as serious as Chernobyl, does that make this a global disaster in addition to being a Japanese disaster? Uh, yes, I think in a number of ways it, it does. Uh, first of all, um, Chernobyl did inject a lot of radioactivity into the atmosphere, and that did uh, go around the northern hemisphere. There were certain aspects of that release that we probably wouldn't see here. It was a, a much hotter plume and it went much higher. But um, I think we can expect there will be some detectable radioactivity if there were an event of that size uh, in Japan. But also the, the other ramifications are clearly economic and uh, also they have to do with our ability to mitigate climate change. Uh, our organization, uh, UCS, is not opposed to nuclear power per se, 
We do worry about climate change and we understand nuclear power is one option, but we shouldn't take that option off the table by running nuclear power plants in an unsafe way because obviously a catastrophe like this could uh, really eliminate uh, the possibility of that option. So our, we believe that nuclear plants really have to make an extra effort to be as safe and secure as possible. And unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the attitude of the nuclear industry, either in the United States or abroad. Let me ask you one last question about that attitude and that seriousness about safety. If there is a meltdown, God forbid, at either one of these affected nuclear power plants that have now been declared emergency sites by the Japanese government, we will be counting on the containment units around the reactors themselves uh, to confine the damage. Just so we understand it, can you just explain for a lay audience what a containment unit is like if one's ever been tested in a real life disaster before and if we should assume that they might be compromised by the earthquake and the tsunami themselves? Well, the uh, containment structures are generally reinforced concrete buildings that have a leak tight liner. And the idea behind the containment is really if you have a, a what's called a design basis accident where uh, you have a partial melting of the core but you don't have any catastrophic explosion, that that containment will function to limit radiation releases. Unfortunately, after most reactors operating today were designed and built. They discovered that, well, there are certain types of events that could challenge the containment and they're not impossible. So most of the containment buildings at reactors today are vulnerable to certain severe events that could threaten uh, their capacity to contain radiation. And unfortunately, the Mark I boiling water reactor, which is what we have at, at Fukushima, has vulnerabilities uh, that people have known about for a long time that if there were a core melt that escaped from the reactor vessel, it might also breach the containment. And so, um, so I think there's a wide range of containment buildings out there, but I am concerned about the Mark I's in particular and their ability to contain radiation in this event. Dr. Edwin Lyman, senior scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, you have helped me understand this better and you have not set my mind at ease uh, at all. Uh, but thank you for helping us explain it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You look at the devastation caused in Japan and it makes you realize just how huge an 8.9 earthquake is. But consider that there may be no other country in the world that is better prepared for earthquakes than Japan is. What happened to Japan is horrific and it is still unfolding. And the reasons why it wasn't an even bigger disaster than it was are really important and in some cases surprising. A live report from Japan about what has happened, what is happening now, and some of the reasons this catastrophe is not even worse, plus a further nuclear safety update coming up later in the show. Please stay with